uh, event uh, of the program in experimental critical theory for this year. Uh, we're delighted uh, to have such an uh, exciting group of speakers on such a, a terrifically interesting, important, um, and c current topic. Um, I want to thank um, all the speakers um, uh, for coming, but in particular, I really need to uh, thank my collaborator on this, uh, Ian Bogost, who uh, is the, the germ of the whole conference. He uh, suggested that we do this. People were going to be in town, and I said, yes, let's do it. And I'm so pleased that Ian did. And for uh, some of you who do not know Ian personally, I hope all of you know his work, and if not, it will be introduced later on. Uh, Ian was indeed a, a graduate student in comparative literature here. And um, I just wanted to tell a little bit story about Ian's uh, career as a graduate student because it was quite unusual. Uh, <laughs> Ian was, um, as a graduate student here, was very busy, shall we put it this way to begin with. He was uh, uh, working pretty much full-time, or more than full-time, uh, with his own business, uh, writing software, and doing very interesting things. And he wasn't really putting a lot of attention into his graduate school career. Um, by the time he came to his uh, prospectus writing stage, he um, wrote a lengthy document on, uh, of all things, for those of you who know his work now, you'll be surprised, on Bukowski and Baudelaire. And uh, it was a big mess of a document. And we had um, a group of very high-powered uh, colleagues um, all taking a very serious looking look at this. And we did something which is frankly almost unheard of at UCLA. We failed. <laughs> it was just not a great prospectus. And it was not what he was really interested in. We knew that his interests were otherwise, that he was doing fabulous stuff with technology, with software, with philosophy, and we wanted him to work on that. And so it was a very traumatic thing. Uh, we told Ian, you know, this isn't going to work, but come back with another prospectus, which he did. It was fantastic. It was uh, his first book, and uh, we were utterly thrilled. And I think it was a good story. A good there's a moral there that sometimes it's very important to tell people no, don't do this. Stop what you think you're doing. It's not good. And even to fail people, <laughs> we we have to be able to say no in order to let people really say yes. Uh, it's very Lacanian. So I was very happy that uh, things worked out so well for Ian, and I'm delighted to now let Ian introduce our first speaker uh, and the conference as a whole. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, after, they, after they failed me, um, and, I, and I started doing the right things, um, I remember um, I guess it's, it's al almost 10 years ago now, I remember uh, writing uh, an email to, uh, to OpenCourt, uh, the book publisher, asking, uh, when is this tool being book going to come out? Because I was waiting to read it, and it had all these great keywords in the description and the title. Um, and it was late, right? It was, it was the, 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 publishing, the pub publication date had passed. Um, and I was looking on Amazon or whatever and you know, waiting for the book to come out. And they actually wrote back, uh, which is surprising. They said, oh, you know, it's, it, it'll be out soon, it'll be out soon. Um, uh, and, and so I, I read and then, and then uh, you know, cited uh, uh, Tool Being in my dissertation and then my first book. And that was, um, uh, you know, just kind of a, a passing interest. I thought there were some interesting ideas that connected to some work I was, I was thinking about with respect to, uh, to software and computing. And um, and then one day out of the blue, I got this email from Graham Harmon, um, which was surprising, and I recognized the name. And uh, he had found uh, my book by searching on Amazon. You may not know this, but if you don't, you should. If you search for your name on Amazon, it will not only return books uh, that you've written or others that have uh, uh, that are similar that people have purchased, but also citations. Uh, and we started talking, and um, and now I don't know how many years later. Um, yeah, here we are, and uh, and now I'm doing uh, this crazy philosophy stuff again, which is which is fantastic. So it's all kind of come come full circle in a certain way. Uh, Graham Harmon has been a, a tremendously industrious uh, philosopher. Um, his his I started listing uh, his books to remind myself uh, uh, of them. Uh, they include Tool Being, Guerrilla Metaphysics, 
uh, Heidegger Explained, which is a great short book uh, on, uh, on Heidegger, um, which is not shameful to read, even if you think you know Heidegger, I don't think. Prince of Networks uh, on the work of Bruno Latour. Two brand new books uh, towards speculative realism and Circus Philosophicus, which I guess I would describe as parables. Is that the right word? Um, and then uh, forthcoming books next year, um, one, The Quadruple Object, which is out in French now, and Quentin uh, Sue Philosophy in the Making. Uh, and this is all since, uh, since 2002 or so, these, uh, these, uh, these books. Uh, I, th I suppose the, the way I would, I would like to characterize uh, Graham Harmon by way of, 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 of introduction to his introduction to speculative realism an object-oriented ontology is to suggest that he is really the first philosopher of the 21st century and is giving us the first new philosophy in much longer than that. So please welcome Graham Hartman. Thank you, Ian, and good morning to everybody in the room and also to everyone who's watching the live stream on Tim Morton's blog, which we hope is working. And to those who are watching and don't understand why I'm wearing this Mount Etna sweatshirt, it's because Los Angeles is uncharacteristically cold at the moment, and I bought this at the top of Mount Etna in September, and it served me well there and is serving me well here in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm going to give an introductory lecture right now about speculative realism and object-oriented ontology, which are two closely related philosophical groups, and I'm the only shared member of both, and so I guess I'm the right person to, to weigh in on both. And, of course, I have two different audiences here. I have some people in the audience who are completely saturated with this stuff already, both from reading books and from reading blogs, and I have other people who may not know anything about it or not, not much about it, and so I want to try to pitch this at a level that everyone can enjoy, covering familiar terrain maybe in a fresh way. Speculative realism and object-oriented ontology. Well, the easy answer, to, uh, the easy way to explain their relation is that speculative realism is the larger term. It, it encompasses a greater range of philosophical positions. However, it's not as old. Object-oriented philosophy is an older term. It's one that I coined in 1999, and I was the only one for quite a while until first Levi jumped on board, and then we have Ian and, and Tim uh, now as well. Um, Whereas speculative realism is a term, is a group, it, it dates to 2006 and is a term to 2007. And I'll give you a little bit of the history here. Speculative realism was a group, originally the brainchild of Ray Brassier, who was then at Middlesex University in London and is now at the American University of Beirut. He had a, a somewhat vague idea of, of bringing together me, himself, and Ian Hamilton Grant of Bristol for a, an event because he thought there were some similar interests there in speculative philosophy, a similar shared frustration with some of the dominant trends in continental philosophy. And then what happened in early 2006, something very remarkable, a book appeared in France called Après la finitude, After finitude by Quentin Mersou, who may be described, I guess, as the star pupil of Badiou. And uh, Ray Brassier returned from Paris from vacation and told me there's this book I've got to read that's right up my alley. alley. He hadn't had a chance to read it yet himself, but I immediately ordered it and read it and was, was transfixed by this fascinating book by Mayasu. I wish he could be here with us today as well. Uh, but speculative realism has now become a, a looser term encompassing many more people. It's no longer a rigid designator for those four people who met at Goldsmiths College in 2007. It's more of a rallying cry that you find especially in the blogosphere, uh, especially among the young. People under 30 are very drawn to this term. So I would say if there's one term or one, one concept that links together all the speculative realists, it's this critique of correlationism. Now, what is correlationism? Uh, correlationism is a term coined by Mayasu. Uh, he wanted to call his opponents idealists, but you really can't, because Husserl's not really just an idealist, right? Because Husserl can say the mind is always already outside itself, pointing at objects. Uh, Kantians can say Kant gives a refutation of idealism. Nobody is, almost no one's going to come out and admit to being a full-blown idealist these days. But there's still a problem. The problem is that all of these dominant philosophies in continental thought today, humans are very much at the center. Object-object uh, relations are really nowhere to be seen if they're not mediated by a human observer in some way. And so correlationism is the term that Mayasu coined because what's at the center of all these philosophies is a correlate of human and world. What's always at the center of these philosophies is human and world together. You can't talk about the world by itself. You can't talk about a disembodied Cartesian subject by itself, but you have to talk about their mutual interplay. And this, in a way, is more dangerous than idealism because it thinks it's already beyond it. It thinks it's already more sophisticated than that. In continental philosophy, there's a tendency to view the realism-idealism dispute as a pseudo-problem. Husserl and Heidegger, two of my favorite philosophers, are both extremely guilty of this. They simply sneer at the question. Um, 
I think it's safe to say, although realism has always been a, a palatable option in analytic philosophy in, in many quarters, I think it's safe to say it never was in continental philosophy until 2002, I think Delanda and I were the first two to openly say we're realists in the continental tradition. Not to be playing around with ironic formulations, but just to say we're realists. Bruno Latour had called himself a realist in 1999 in Pandora's Hope, but there was irony there and he was redefining what the term meant. He wasn't really a realist in that sense. So I think Delanda and I in 2002 were the first to make that a plausible option again. Uh, and then Maya Su's book came out a couple of years later, four years later. All right, so correlationism is neither realism nor idealism. It tries to be beyond both. Um, but it always places the human and world at the center. And the roots of this philosophy clearly lie in Kant, Immanuel Kant, where you, you can't talk about the relations between things and themselves. This will be dogmatic. So you have to retreat and take this critical stance towards everything first. And this is what philosophy becomes about. Philosophy becomes a meditation on the correlates. What are the categories of the understanding uh, by which we can encounter the world? What are the linguistic structures? through which the world is accessible, and so forth. Simply talking about the world has become very difficult in the past 200 years of continental thought. Now, and because, uh, because of this, speculative realism has had a certain flavor of anti-Kantian critique, or critique of Kant, and sometimes this gets caricatured as saying the speculative realists all just say Kant is evil. That's actually Ayn Rand, that's not us. <laughs> um, because we're not saying Kant is evil. The, the point is, each of us preserves one key aspect of Kant, and it's different in each case. And I'm going to focus today on the object-oriented version with which I am associated and Kant and Mayasu's speculative materialism. And I do have a book about Mayasu coming out in July. I just finished it a few weeks ago. It's called Kant and Mayasu, colon, Philosophy in the Making. And this will include a, an in-depth survey of all of his published works in English, both after, after finitude and the articles in the journal Collapse, as well as 90 pages of translated excerpts from his long-withheld major work, L'Inexistence Divine, or The Divine in Existence, which is quite a remarkable and bold piece of work in which uh, there is, God might exist in the future but does not yet exist. Uh, you can read it for yourself when the book comes out. Now, the, correlate, the human world correlate does two separate things. One of them I endorse, one of them Mayasu endorses. The first thing it does is it puts the human world relation at the center of things. Philosophy is about the relation between human and world. A great counterexample, someone who doesn't accept this at all, will be Whiteheads. And we're all here partly because we have a Whitehead conference at Claremont in a few days. And Whitehead is, is really the, maybe the boldest 20th century philosopher in simply disregarding the Kantian tradition, he along with Bergson, but especially Whitehead. That's one thing. It puts the human-world relation at the center. And the other thing is it limits our knowledge. It's a theory of finitude. There's something out there that we can't quite know exhaustively. Now, I think it's safe to say that Mayasu's position and object-oriented philosophy take the reverse positions on these two features. For Mayasu, it's fine that the human world relation is at the center. Mayasu thinks correlationism is a strong argument. If I try to talk about a tree outside of thought, well, then I'm thinking it, and so it's not really outside of thought. Right? And so this is Mayasu's starting point. Mayasu thinks that's a powerful argument, and it takes lots of logical trickery to escape from that in his book. For me, that's a weak argument. I, I, I think that's... A, We'll talk about that a little more as this talk goes on, but I don't think it's very strong at all. What Mayasu is bothered by in Kant is the finitude of human knowledge, the idea that we can't know the things in themselves. Mayasu is a partisan of absolute knowledge. Uh, his real roots are in Hegel. Uh, he, like Badiou and Zizek, are not realists in the normal sense, in that there's something outside of the mind that we can't grasp. Uh, That's why they tend, to, they tend to call themselves materialists rather than realists, because they think there is something outside the mind, but it's knowable. It can be comprehended according to certain features that we can know about it. Whereas object-oriented philosophy takes the reverse position on these things. Uh, for me, finitude is inevitable because a thing cannot be translated into knowledge of the thing. It's not like a thing has a certain number of qualities, and by mapping those qualities in your mind, you can replicate the thing exactly in your mind. The thing is, is an act. The thing is a reality. Any knowledge we have of that is only going to be a translation. And so for me, the finitude is inevitable. This is Kant's greatest strength. Whereas for me, the human world correlate is the problem with Kant's. And this, I picked this up from reading Whiteheads late in my graduate school career uh, carefully, that the human world relation is simply a special case of any relation at all. Any relation will distort its terms with respect to one another. It's not just this sad, poignant feature of human knowledge that I can't grasp all the aspects of the table. This is something the flooring uh, is guilty of as well. They might not be conscious of it only humans are, but no object is going to perfectly translate another into its own terms. So, in a way, we simply, uh, my position, OOO, and Mayasu simply have two opposite takes on Kant. 
Okay, let's start with realism and then go on to the speculative parts. First of all, if we ask what is realism, there's a very wonderful book that came out a couple of years ago by a gentleman named Lee Braver called A Thing of This World. And this is a very important book. It's a gigantic book, Northwestern University Press, well worth a read, in which he surveys the entire history of continental philosophy and tries to show that it's all an anti-realist tradition. He starts with, I guess he starts with Kant, doesn't he? And he goes all the way to Derrida, who was kind of the crowning moment of anti-realism. And you wonder what, what's left after, after Derrida. There seems to be not much room. Uh, what's important about this book is that Braver came right out and mapped continental philosophy in terms of the realism, anti-realism dispute at all, which is usually considered this pseudo-problem that has nothing to do with the deeper philosophical considerations. And the other important thing about Braver's book is that he is aware of the ambiguity of what the term realism means. He says there are at least six different features, which he calls R1 through R6, and then he pairs them with their antimatter complements, A1 through A6, the anti-realist versions. So, for example, R1, which is the most important, the world exists independently of the minds, whereas A1 will be the world does not exist independently of the minds. And what he does so subtly is he goes through and shows that some of these thinkers can be realists on some points and anti-realists on others. So he's able to say that, I don't remember, Nietzsche is an A1, but R3, R4, A5. And it's actually very helpful. You have that glossary in the front that tells you what each of the positions is. Now, one of my complaints about that book, which I reviewed for Philosophy Today, and I like it very much, in case Lee is watching, I'll remind him that I really love his book. The one thing I, I, I was not so happy with is that he missed, to me, one of the key features of realism, which I call R7, which does not appear in his book, which is that all relations have to be on the same footing, that you can't privilege the human world relation as the, as the root of all the others, as happens in Kant's philosophy, whereas A7 would be that the human world correlate is primary. So I think this is the key, the key point he missed on his list. Also, I think some of his realist points are not essential to realism. For example, the correspondence theory of truth is on his list. Maybe it was R6, or I don't remember, that the, that the, um, the mind can adequately map the world. I don't think that's really necessary to be a realist. I, you can make the case that Heidegger's a realist, but he's certainly not a believer in the correspondence theory of truth. There is, you know, being is, out, is there outside of us, perhaps, but you can't adequately mirror it in your mind. You can unveil it gradually. So I would say that... But Braver knows this. Braver knows that not every realism has to have all the realist features. Okay. Now, you could say that Mayasu and I agree about R1. We both agree that there's a mind-independent reality, but I think his sense of it is too weak because I, he, as a partisan of absolute knowledge, he thinks you can actually know, you can exhaustively grasp the essence of the table, and I think this is a problem. I think this puts human knowledge too much in the driver's seat in reality, and I'll get to this in a moment here. So that's the realism part. Uh, the speculative part is maybe the surprising adjective when added to realism, because realism is usually seen as a boring, dull, middle-aged philosophy that's there to draw limits to wild speculation and you know, stop this pie-in-the-sky idealism and get down to the facts. Um, it's a kind of inhibited philosophy. As I said in one of my publications, I don't remember which one, that realism is the philosophy as health inspectors are to restaurants. <laughs> they're, they're simply, it's viewed that they're simply there to stop people from going too far, making any messes, and hence the importance of this adjective, speculative. You've all heard of men are from Mars, women are from Venus. I would say that uh, realism's from Saturn, speculation's from Jupiter, to continue the astrological metaphor. Because what is Saturn traditionally? It's the planet of inhibition, of, of uh, challenge, of forcing you to get down to, to the reality and, and face your limitations, whereas Jupiter is always the planet of speculation, of expansiveness, of rolling the dice and winning. And so putting these two together is a very powerful combination, that you could have a realism that is a weird realism, as we call it sometimes, a realism that is not just a commonsensical theory of billiard balls outside the mind that really do hit each other and move each other, but a, a kind of theory that gives a strange version of reality uh, that realists normally are not associated with. And you could if, read Mayasu's books or mine and you'll quickly see what that entails. For example, in Mayasu's philosophy, uh, you already have an after finitude radical contingency in which anything can happen at any moment for no reason whatsoever. That's not your typical sort of realism. Um, in his still unpublished major work, L'inexistence divine, you have uh, a god that can appear or not appear suddenly at any moment for any reason, whatever, and, and inaugurate a, realm, uh, a reign of perfect justice that will also resurrect the dead and compensate them for their sufferings. He thinks this is the only object worthy of ethical thought. So this is, again, a fairly wild-sounding theory that does not sound within the realm of probability, which he deals with by denying the importance of probability. Things cannot be measured in terms of likely or unlikely at that level. Um, and then in my theory, you have objects that cannot touch directly 
they're withdrawn from one another, they can inter interact only indirectly. So these are not your typical sorts of, of common sense realisms. Okay, so not only is there a world outside the mind, but the world outside the mind is weird, and it has very little to do with common sense. Let me talk a little about Maeso's version in a little more detail for some of you who haven't read the book, and then I'll go into my alternative after saying what I think is unsuccessful about his theory, although I'm a great admirer of it. I, I'm not a devotee of his theory at all. We're, we are at odds over many points. Uh, Maeso's book, After Finitude, begins with the problem of ancestrality, which is sometimes misunderstood. The, the correlationist says... If I speak about the world, I'm only speaking about the world for me, right? Because I can't escape this loop. If I try to talk about the Big Bang, well, it's only the Big Bang for me because I cannot get outside this circle of thought and talk <coughs> about something without talking about it or without thinking about it. And so I'm kind of stuck in this self-reflexive loop. And what Mayasu does at the beginning of the book is he points out this is an aporia for science because what does science claim to do? Science claims to make literal statements about things that happened before any consciousness emerged. Now, this is not a proof. Uh, Mayasu just does this to call our attention to a problem, that there's a discrepancy between what science claims to do and what the correlation is claimed uh, is the foundation of human knowledge, which is that we cannot escape from this loop. Um, and I'm going to show you a chart here, because it, some people misunderstand, I think, the beginning of that book and think that Mayasu is just a straightforward realist. He's not. Mayasu is a great admirer of correlationist philosophy, and I, in my opinion, he never fully escapes it. I think this is the problem with his, his theories. I, in my book... I described four positions that I call Mayasu's spectrum. He doesn't give it this name. And there's actually more like six or seven in his presentation. I've oversimplified a little bit, but these are the four main ones. Here you have naive realism, which he totally abhors. He completely supports Kant's attack on this, on dogmatic, naive or dogmatic realism. This is the idea that there is a world independent of the mind and we can adequately know it. Okay, this is pre-Kantian dogmatism. Then you have the position he calls weak correlationism, which is essentially Kant's. You can think the things themselves, but not know them. There has to be something out there, but we can't know them. We can at least think that they're there. This is not good enough for Masu because it doesn't take the correlationist objection seriously enough. It doesn't realize that we can't talk about the things in themselves without talking about them and therefore bringing them back into the circle of thought. So this is essentially the German idealist objection to Kant that, that Masu supports. And let's go all the way to absolute idealism now for a second. And this will be the idea that you absolutely cannot speak about anything outside the mind because you're always going to be stuck in that reflexive loop. Now, what Mayasu tries to do, and I don't think it works, is he tries to insert this intermediate position that he calls strong correlations, which is, there's several ways he formulates it, but the relevant one here is, I can't think of anything outside the mind, and yet there still might be something outside the mind. Whereas the absolute idealist says, and therefore there can't be, since I'm stuck in this loop of thoughts, if I try to talk about the tree outside of thought, it's something I'm thinking, and therefore it becomes recuperated by the, by the circle of correlation. Mayasu says, yes, but all that proves is that we can't think anything outside of it. There still might be something outside of it. And so he tries to insert this, this uh, new position here. And this is important because Mayasu's own philosophy is a radicalization of this, just as I would say my own philosophy is a radicalization at this point. Why? Uh, because in a way, I'm, I'm preserving Kant's point that there are things in themselves that we can't we can think them and not know them, and simply extending it to all entities, so that it's not simply humans. It's not this, again, this poignant theory of human finitude, but it's something that haunts all relations at all, because you, a, thing can, a thing cannot be replicated in its appearance to another. A, a, thing, a, a table does things like support the computer, like sit on the floor. My knowledge of the, of the table does not do any of those things. Right? My knowledge, so the, the table is not just a, a set of qualities that can be replicated in my mind that exhaustively model the table. Uh, more about that in a minute, but Mayasu's attempt is to radicalize this position, strong correlations. What Mayasu does, which is actually very brilliant, is say um, strong correlationism is different from absolute idealism because there might be something outside. We know there might be something outside. And he says that's an absolute possibility. It is absolutely true that there might be something outside. If it weren't, then we would just be absolute idealists. And then he, he transforms that absolute possibility into the absolute contingency of everything he tries to, so that uh, you, can't, you can't say that anything has any reason whatsoever. There is, the, the principle of sufficient reason collapses for me. <clears throat> now, in my opinion, this, this position is impossible, because it's meaningless to say that there might be something outside of us if everything becomes recuperated by the correlation. So, so in other words, if I say, I can't think the table outside thought, but there might be something outside of thought, 
That's a meaningless statement for Mason's position because to speak of something outside thought is already a thought in his position, right? And so I don't think he can get enough traction to escape that at all. I think he is driven to absolute idealism. I think his position, uh, his attempt at an original position cannot work. Okay. From this, from proving the absolute contingency of all things, as he thinks he proves, he thinks he's able to prove the law of non-contradiction and the existence of things in themselves through a very bold set of, of arguments. Uh, what he says is if, if there are a contradictory thing, it cannot be contingent because a contradictory thing has no opposite and cannot pass in anything else and therefore it must exist. As for things in themselves, he says there must be things in themselves because there can't be contingency in, unless there are things that are contingent since he's already proven the existence of contingency, he thinks. So he ends up with the belief that there are non-contradictory things in themselves, but that they have absolutely no reason whatsoever for being as they are. And on this basis, he uh, dismisses the laws of probability when you're talking about the level of natural laws. Why? Because he says we can measure probability for intraworldly things. We can measure the probability that a, this marker will roll one direction or another if I push it a certain way. But he says, as far as laws themselves, we cannot know through the mere repetition of laws that they are inevitable, that they are they're necessary, because we have no idea how many possible universes there are. They can't be totalized. He uses Cantor's transfinite mathematics like Badiou does to try to show that at the level of worlds, you can never show what the probability of improbability of certain laws of nature existing or not existing are. And therefore, um, probability is irrelevant at that level, and therefore he builds his entire philosophy of history out of incredibly implausible events, incredibly implausible jumps. He says there's been several. First there was matter, then there was life, and life coming out of matter was not for a reason. It wasn't because there was a particular configuration of cells that are able to live. There's simply a radical jump for no reason for the appearance of life, and from life to thought, the same thing. Life jumps to thought for no reason at all. And uh, once you're at thought, what's left to do? He, he, he thinks that human thought is the highest thing there is, the only thing radical enough to match those jumps is justice. And this is what's going to require the virtual God to come and create a reign of justice and resurrect all the dead who suffered and were killed so wrongly. And it sounds completely improbable. It sounds like science fiction when you read it, but when you think about it, he, he attempts to pave the way for this by assaulting the notion of probability of likelihood and unlikelihood. And so you end up with this theory which instead of measuring the probable steps in history, he measures the radical contours of history and that's how we judge history. We judge it by what are the most radical possible jumps that it could occur, and the fourth one is the last one. And then he has to add all these other things at the end of the book, like uh, wouldn't we be dissatisfied if that world of justice came? What would we have left to live for if everything were perfect? There'd be a kind of despair we'd be left with. <laughs> and also, the other question he has to answer politically is why should we work for this world of justice if it's going to happen for no reason at all? If it's just going to jump out of nowhere without our causing it, what's the point of going and holding marches and... and lobbying for the rights of workers and things. He says it's because the world of justice will have no meaning unless we hope for it in advance. It has to be something humans hope for, so it's as if we caused it. Even though we know it's, it's not something we caused, it's as if. He's also got an, a, a more detailed philosophy of history in that book in which he talks about how history has been dominated by a series of symbols. Symbols of what the ideal is. I mean, ancient, the ancient world was cosmological. right? That the heavens were a perfect realm uh, beneath which the earth paled and that collapsed, of course, thanks to Galileo and Newton, um, was replaced by um, the romantic symbol, which is the idea that sentimentality, suffering should be avoided. Every, every living creature naturally has pity for every other. That collapsed because, for the reason that it seems obviously false. Um, <laughs> and what, the, what we are left with then is what he calls the historical symbol, which is the belief that there's an invisible hand guiding the course of events, in this case, the economy. It's a very interesting reading he gives. That we just tr both the Marxists and capitalists will say that all the random individual actions lead naturally towards the good end, either the destruction of capitalism or the, the amassing of wealth. And so we, we have this kind of naive idea, just as the ancients had in, in the per perfection of the cosmos, we have this naive idea about the perfection of the economy. And that the economy and history are taking us in the right direction automatically and impersonally. And he wants to replace that with his own symbol, which is the hope for justice, the absolute hope for redemption for all people who have died uh, unjustly. So that gives you a brief overview of the two books, as much as I could have done in seven or eight minutes. And I just want to say briefly what I think the problems are with his philosophy. There are, there are at least five. Um, the first of them is I don't think the correlational circle is a very strong objection. Uh, his entire philosophical standpoint is based on the idea that it's this devastating problem that how can I think something outside thought without turning into a thought? 
And it's occurred to me in the last couple of years that this is really the same as Mino's paradox in Plato's Mino. That you can't know something if you don't know it, and you can't, know, you can't search for something if you already know it. You either know something or you don't. Of course, Socrates' response to this is, it's a love of wisdom. You can know something without knowing it. You can. Our entire discipline is based on this idea that you can know something without knowing it. And I think Mayasu's uh, approach denies that. You end up with... His philosophy ends up being a wisdom about thoughts rather than a love of wisdom about the reality. I've already said that I think strong correlation is, is impossible. I, in my book, I compare it to certain Zen maxims. It's like the sound of one hand clapping or the gateless gates. You know, to think that you... I can't think anything outside of, of thought, but there might be something outside of thought. Well, what does that mean? That's a meaningless statement when judged from within Mayasu's own position. I don't think it's possible. And in, in Prince of Networks, I didn't spell this out, but that was, that was at the basis of my claim there that in the latter part of the book, that this is what he really is. He really is an absolute idealist, just as I think Badiou and Zizek are as well. And that's really the, the current in which he's working. Here's another problem. There is no theory of part and whole in Mayasu. And let me explain what I mean by that. He talks about the contingency of events linked to each other across time. He's talking about efficient causation across time. So there's no reason that I can't grow wings in the next second and fly away. This could happen for any reason. What he doesn't talk about are causal relations within an instance, right? Which are part whole, it can be looked at as part whole relations, mereology. What is, could I be made of gold atoms or of armies of little horses rather than what I've made of now? This is not an issue he, he tackles. I suppose he would say yes, because he thinks everything's contingent, but it's not something he cares about. He, time is what he cares about. He even says problems of space are not that interesting. Um, and this was in response to my review in philosophy today, I believe. He added a, a couple pages in the English version of After Finitude that weren't in the French, and I'm pretty sure they're in response to my review, mm -hmm. where I said, why is the Big Bang more problematic than an object in a refrigerator in an abandoned house that we're not seeing? <laughs> um, and he's actually, I think, too dismissive of that objection in his, in his supplement to the English book. He says, that's not so interesting because even if I'm not looking at the object in the refrigerator right now, I could, in principle, go and look at the object in the refrigerator, whereas I could not, in principle, go see the Big Bang because there was no consciousness. I don't think this argument works. I could, in principle, go see the Big Bang if certain conditions were met. Um, and I think this happens because his theory of the thing in itself simply isn't deep enough. Mayasu thinks he proves the existence of things in themselves. But if you look at what they are, all the thing in things in themselves really means for Mayasu is that if we all die, they're still going to be there. All these objects in the room will still be here if we die. That's only part of the thing in itself for Kant. The other part is, what, how does the thing in itself differ when we're not dead and we're here looking at it? How does it differ from what we see? For Mayasu, not at all. For Mayasu, knowledge can absolutely exhaust the thing. Uh, he does not believe in, fin in the finitude of knowledge whatsoever. And I think that's not a strong enough sense of the, the thing in itself, things in themselves, as I'll explain in a minute when I talk about Heidegger. And finally, there's an ambiguity about law in his system. He, Mansu says the laws of nature are absolutely contingent and can change at any moment for any reason, for no reason, for no reason at all. There is no reason for anything. But then he accepts the existence of laws. This is the strange thing. He does believe there's a thing called laws, just that they can change at any time. So um, there are certain banal things that happen in nature according to law. It's only now and then that we have this radical change of the laws of nature for no reason whatsoever. It might not be frequent. It might be only once in a while. Why does he have any concept of laws at all? If he's really concerned about the absolute contingency of everything, there should be no law-bound interconnections between things at all. They should happen in complete independ independence. I think here he's simply stuck in this Badiouian rut of thinking there has to be a distinction between the state of the situation and truth events. Right? That there has to be one realm that's kind of boring and unfolding predictably, and then once in a while there's this amazing transformation. And I don't think that's radical enough. I think he should have said that there's an absolute contingency, like the occasionalists do, from Islamic philosophy on and through modern French philosophy. Nothing's connected to anything else. They say God connects everything. I'm not saying you should say God connects everything, but I think you should raise the problem of what connects everything. You can't just assume that there are laws most of the time. So, to repeat, uh, Masu wants to dump finitude from Kant, but he wants to preserve the human world's priority, and I want to do the opposite. I think the finitude is inevitable, absolute knowledge is impossible, yet we need to expand this so that it's not just a matter of epistemological matter of human knowledge, it, it infests the very nature of causal relations, so that when fire burns cotton, fire does not exhaust the cotton any more than my knowledge of the cotton exhausted, to use another Islamic example. Um, so I would, I would recommend the opposite of what Masu does. Uh, Mansu radicalizes strong correlationism, which I say is impossible because I say strong correlationism does not exist. I think it's a, it's a hopeless, it's a mission impossible for Mansu. Whereas I'm saying we should, we should uh, radicalize this, which is very possible. We correlationism is possible. We just radicalize Kant by coupling that tradition with Whitehead's tradition, 
or Leibniz, even Leibniz is in some way, which is that all the relations are on equal footing. Every relation distorts the, the relatum in the same fashion as human consciousness does. Human consciousness is more sophisticated, more interesting perhaps, but not ontologically different. What humans do should not be made part of a basic ontological fissure in the cosmos. It's just, we're simply one very complicated and interesting entity among others. Okay, so how are we doing? I got more time. I want to go on to the object-oriented position now, now that I've critiqued Mea Seuss. This position for me goes back to the 1990s. It started uh, for me back in, when I was working my master's degree work at Penn State with Lingus. Uh, I was writing on Heidegger and Levinas, and the first thing I noted is that um, the tool analysis isn't just the tool analysis. It's not just about hammers and drills. It applies to any entities, and so you can universalize it. And if you push it far enough, in a way, all of Heidegger's ideas boil down to that tool analysis, because all of Heidegger's about this veiling and unveiling and uh, being upsurging from the depths, and that's really all there in the tool analysis, despite what some people say. But I read it differently from how most people read it. The way most people read it, it's often read as a kind of pragmatism, right? or a primacy of practical reason. That deeper than theory is the fact that we are practically using the floor, and we're using the podium, we're using language. Um, that's the kind of unthematized background from which all of our consciousness emerges. There's a problem with this, though, which is that the things also withdraw from practice. Using a hammer does not exhaust the hammer any more than looking at the hammer and talking about it does. Heideggerians still usually do not see this point. They still want to, usually, not, not all of them, but some of them, most of them want to say that theoretical distortion of the hammer or the S structure is somehow more special than any other kind, but praxis does this as well. And so pragmatism can't work. And that's the second step. The third step is to say that entities do this to each other as well. And this is the contribution of Whitehead's position, that it's not just that there's something magical about the human brain that is unable to capture the reality of things. A causal relation also is not a total relation. Right? A causal relation, fire, when fire burns the cotton, fire burns something flammable about the cotton. It doesn't burn the color of the odor, which are of no interest to the fire whatsoever. Um, so it's not, we shouldn't distinguish between humans and inanimate objects on that level on the basis of the fact that we supposedly have conscious and the consciousness and they don't. What is more primary is the fact that you have a difference between reality and relation. Any relation is going to translate the reality into something different from what it was. That is really the basis of OOO. Um, another author who really helped me here was Zubiri, the Spanish philosopher who is not widely read. He wrote this big technical book called On Essence in the 1960s. It was translated to English in 1980. You can still get it in used copies uh, on Amazon and places like this. And you need a couple months to get through it, but I would recommend this. It, the tone of the book is kind of a, a dull, sort of Thomist, scholastic philosophy, but the ideas are really strange. And it's, uh, in fact, the first time I read the book, he, I said he cannot possibly be right about this, but he, I think he is now. And that idea is that the essence of a thing, things do have an essence for him, which is deeper than any of their relations with other things. So you can never define a thing in relational terms. Um, and this got me thinking against Heidegger's tool analysis, that a, you know, a hammer is not its relational significance for the other entities in the world. A hammer is something deeper than all those things. It's, it's whatever supports all those possible relations. Because you can keep adding on new relations to the hammer every second, and put the hammer into new contexts, it's still the same hammer. But it's a totally non-relational hammer. It withdraws from all reality. It is completely unexpressed in the world sometimes. And it's anyway not identifiable with all of its relations to the things. So this is the, the weird kind of realism that we have. Not a realism of measurable physical quantities of matter. Because what, what do you do when you get that? You're measuring the weights and the shape of matter. The matter has to be something deeper than those things. I mean, not the matter. The, the, the object itself has to be something deeper than those things. And the problem is Zubiri doesn't go far enough. Zubiri is still a little too traditionalistic in that he thinks that only certain things have an essence. So, for example, a farm does not have an essence, he says, right? Because a farm only has a relational reality. Somebody has to farm it. So there have to be animals on it. So there have to be trucks coming to take the things. I say, who cares? Because a farm is still something deeper than its specific relations to anything right now. A farm might have certain people visiting it today, new people visiting tomorrow, maybe changes its crops next season. It's still the same farm. Uh, so I don't see that the fact that the farm is in relation to things matters. The farm is something deeper than those relations. And what Zubiri ends up with is the, is the essence of the thing, is what he calls the atomic cortical structure, which sounds disappointingly vague and materialistic. And it reminds me of Kripke. You know, Kripke has this wonderful, you know, naming a necessity. You've got the rigid designator pointing at the thing behind any of its qualities. But then what do you end up with is the real essence of things for Kripke. It's how many protons gold has. It's a purely physical material definition. It's not good enough. Um, all right, so I say objects withdraw from each other too. 
And to, to claim otherwise, to claim even as Mayasu does against me that this is anthropomorphizing things, this is what I call the taxonomic fallacy. I call that for the first time in the quadruple logic. The taxonomic fallacy is when you take a basic ontological rift and try to assign it to specific entities embodying that rift. So if you say, for example, there's a difference between absolute knowledge and contextual knowledge, and natural sciences represent the absolute knowledge, and the humanities represent the contextual knowledge, that's an example of the taxonomic fallacy. Um, for example, I saw that the journal Collapse defined speculative realism in this way on its website uh, recently, saying that speculative realism is a philosophy that defends science against the humanities, something like that. No, it's not. Speculative realism is a philosophy that defends reality against relation. That doesn't mean that the natural sciences necessarily do it better than the humanities do. That's their own axe to grind, because they, they have a kind of scientific bias at that journal, which is very different from what object-oriented ontology believes. They're, they're comrades in arms on one limited front, but on another, they're, they're saying exactly the opposite of the truth, in my opinion. Uh, and th another example of the taxonomic fallacy is here. If you say that um, there's reality and then relation, and humans are the ones responsible for relation, because humans are the only ones who are conscious enough to rise above something and think of it as what it is, and thereby distort its reality and have to try to recover that reality through absolute knowledge. No, uh, cotton and fire do this every bit as much as humans do. Humans are, again, different. I'm not saying that cotton balls are, you know, have dreams and emotions and things like this. I'm just saying that there's a more primitive level at which they do resemble us. We're both entities. We both relate to things and distort them through our relations. So, uh, for this reason, I say that absolute knowledge of the, of the kind that Mayasu wants is impossible, because you cannot take a reality and mirror it in a mind. The, what, what is in your mind will not be doing the same work as the real thing. Uh, knowledge of a tree is not the same as the tree. And the objection I always get is, well, that's stupid, that's a straw man. Nobody's claiming that the knowledge of the tree is really a tree. Well, the, I'm not saying they're claiming it, I'm saying their position entails it. Right? That they can't help stumbling into that. If you think, like Mayasu does, that having 100% of the qualities of the tree in your mind is just as good as the real tree, and then when you die, those qualities will still be there, and those qualities together form the tree, no, why is, the, why is the knowledge of the tree in your mind not taking roots and growing fruits and having leaves fall from it? You have to come up with some theory of what the difference is because he's not going to say that. He's not going to say that the idea of the tree in your mind is, is growing fruit, of course. What's the difference? They're going to end up with some lame theory of matter, right? It's these ideas stamped in matter. And then you're back to the most boring traditional kind of platonic theory where it's a form stamped in matter. I don't think they want to say that, but that's where they're driven. The only way to get around that is to say that the realities are a performance, they're an execution, they're an action, and that is only translated into the forms of knowledge that we have of it. And that is why, in my theory, an idea that is absolutely compelling to me but not universally popular is the idea of vicarious causation. Because if one thing always distorts another, if one thing never makes full contact with another, how can it make any contact with it at all? How can a thing, you know, when I hit this podium, how can I make any contact with the podium at all, given the real podium supposedly withdraws from my real hand, according to the, the elements of my theory as laid out already? So there has to be an indirect kind of causation. There has to be some way of explaining how one thing indirectly maneuvers into position to affect another, or to perceive another, or to touch another. And again, this is what led me back to the very venerable occasionalist tradition, which is usually ridiculed, because it's usually viewed just as a naive theology where God is coming down and intervening every second in everything that happens, so that I drop the note cards, God is actually pulling the note cards down, it's not gravity. And This is something undergraduates like making fun of when they hear about Malebranche, fine. But uh, there's some seriousness to this tradition, which is that it, you know, it goes all the way back to Islamic theology in Iraq, the Asherites, uh, who simply had a very radical reading of one passage in the Quran, there's, there's, a, there's a passage in the Quran that refers to, you, you think you threw the stones, but in fact it was Allah who threw the stones. And they simply interpreted that universally to mean all actions are done by God. It's obviously blasphemous in monotheism to claim that anyone has creative power other than God. They were claiming that you also can't say anyone but God has causal power. And so therefore God is intervening. Things exist only for an instant because endurance is an accident that has to be given to things by God. So they're vanishing every instant. This did not immediately penetrate into European philosophy, of course. It took about seven or eight hundred years you can't really find a medieval occasionalist. I've looked around for some, and as far as I can tell, there aren't any. There's, there's Nicolas d'Autrecourt, who's sort of seen as the medieval Hume, but there's not really a medieval occasionalist. Um, the, you, you find Thomas Aquinas attacking the occasionalists, but not by name. Uh, Suarez quotes Aquinas' attack and says that Aquinas doesn't have any names, but he's talking about this occasionalism, and Suarez says it's impossible. He gives reasons why he thinks this is impossible. And of course, it comes back into French philosophy through Descartes' problem of mind relating to body, how can mind and body relate since they're so different? God must be linking them. 
And then after Descartes, it comes back into object-object relations as well. It's not just mind and body, but it's body and body also have this need for occasional causation. Um, and in a way, this, this might sound kind of quaint and antiquated, but it's not. Because what do we do in modern philosophy? The occasionalists give God a monopoly on all causal relations. More recent philosophy simply gives the human mind a monopoly on causal relations. Right? In Hume or Kant, it's habit. Habit's the only thing that really we know gives cause, causal relations between things. For Kant, it's the categories. And so the humans simply replace God. The, the autonomous causal relations between things that are not human and not God disappear from philosophy. Uh, we need to bring them back. This is my thesis. Well, how do we get this? We have to get what I have jokingly, somewhat jokingly called a secular occasionalism. Where we're, we're trying to talk about indirect relations between things that are not through God and not only through the human mind, but directly with each other, but through a mediator. And this was one of the main themes of my book on Latour, Prince of Networks, which is that Latour is really the first secular occasionalist in many ways. Because Latour, despite being a very pious Catholic in his personal life, is not someone who brings God into his philosophy, of course, to do work very often. Um, he's, very, he's a very secular theorist in that way. And what Latour says is any relation between any, any two things needs a mediator. And his classic example is the one about Joliot, the French physicist, who was the first person, at least in France, to link politics with neutrons. Who would have thought that politics had anything to do with neutrons? It takes the atomic bomb project to do that, to show that there might be a political use for these neutrons. And so Latour puts Joliot in as the mediator between those two. There's a problem here for Latour, though, which is that Latour is a completely flat ontology where everything's equal. And so if, if politics and neutrons only touch through Julio, how can Julio touch politics and how can Julio touch neutrons? Doesn't there have to be a mediator there between those? His answer to that has always been unsatisfactory to me. His, his answer has kind of always been a pragmatic one. That, well, you can take the analysis as, as far as you want, as long as it's interesting. And politics and neutrons, that's an interesting link. But, but Julio and neutrons isn't that interesting unless you want to talk about the, the apparatus that he's using. I don't think that works. I think you have to explain metaphysically how it's possible for any contact to happen at all. And in my theory, this is possible, unlike Latour's, because my ontology is not completely flat, as I will review again this afternoon on my last talk. Um, for Latour, everything is real as long as it has an effect on something else, at least in the early Latour. There's no deep reality distinct from an illusory reality. Popeye is just as real as a neutron, because both of them have effects on something else. For me, that's not the way it works, uh, because for me, there is a distinction between the real realm and what I call the sensual realm, which is basically the intentional realm of phenomenology. I don't call it intentional for two reasons. One is it's kind of a boring, sterile technical term, and you know, sensual is a more interesting term. Uh, but then the French translator told me that wasn't a good enough reason, and I needed to add another paragraph, so I did, and he translated it. And the second reason I came up with was that... Um, people get confused about what intentional means, right? Intentional sometimes is used to mean imminent, and sometimes it's used to mean the object you're pointing at outside the imminence. Um, I was reading Barry Smith's book on Austrian philosophy. He criticizes even Dummett for making this mistake. Dummett, in his first edition of the book, said that for Brentano, the intentional object is something outside of the mind you're pointing at, and somebody must have told him that was wrong because it was erased from the, the second edition. And people get very confused about this. There should be no doubt that for both Brentano and Husserl, the intentional object is imminent. It's called imminent objectivity. It's an object that exists in the mind, it's distinct from, from anything that might exist outside the mind, which I don't think ever really is there in Husserl. There's never real objects in Husserl in my, in my reading. So uh, you've got the real realm, which is these withdrawn objects that cannot be translated, and then you've got the sensual realm, which are the things we can encounter, the things we're seeing in the room right now, the things we are, we are in contact with, and not just us, but also inanimate objects when they relate with each other. The cotton ball is encountered by the fire. is also a sensual cotton. The real cotton cannot be present for the fire any more than it can be for us. But both the real realm and the sensual realm are also split apart between their objects and their qualities. This is, this is not something that all the OO people accept. I think, for example, Levi doesn't follow this model. This is my version, where, um, for example, if you look at Husserl, what is Husserl's great discovery? Some people say Husserl's not that interesting. He's just repeating Kant or just, you know, that, that sort of thing. What's really interesting about Husserl, I think, is the, the fact that he talks about a, a tension between intentional objects and intentional qualities, which you don't even really find very strongly in Brentano. Brentano's very indebted to the British empiricist tradition where things are, are bundled together from qualities. In Husserl, you have this real tension because I can walk around a building and see different sides of it at different times. The building is not added up out of all those profiles at every second. It's not added up out of all the possible profiles of the thing, right? The building is a unit over and above those qualities. Moreover, that unit is given from the start. 
I look at it and I see, oh, there's a building. I don't see, oh, there's a profile and I need to look at other profiles to figure out what this is. No, you look through the profile, you see the building. There's an intentional object there that's a unity that endures to these fluctuations of, this, of the sensual realm where you're walking around a thing, seeing it in different moods, different distances, different angles. Um, so there's that tension there in the, in the sensual realm. The same tension was already known in the real realm because you've got, for example, in Leibniz, this idea that monads are units, but as units, they must have a plurality of qualities. If everything was just a unit, all things would be the same. And so there must be a unity and a diversity combined. And so you see, even in the real realm, there is this tension between unified objects and their plurality of qualities. So you've got four poles. You've got the, the real realm, which is hidden from us, which has unified objects and their many qualities. You've got the sensual realm, which Husserl showed very well, has the same tension. So you've got a fourfold. I have tried to argue in several publications that this is really what Heidegger was getting at with his fourfold. It takes a lot of painstaking reconstruction because he's very vague about what this means. I think you have to go back to the early Heidegger, back to 1919, when he's 29, 30 years old, where he gives a he gives his own fourfold theory there, not in terms of earth, sky, gods, and mortals, like in the Poetic Later Works, but uh, in terms of Husserl's philosophy, where he, this, he says this is what it is. You've got the object as something specific, and it's something at all. And you've got the object hidden from us that's something specific, something at all. So there, too, you've got this idea that the object is unified, but it also has a diversity of qualities. And that duality exists at two levels. It exists for us, or for observers of any kind, and exists in itself. So if you read The Quadruple Object, which was published in French two weeks ago and will be out in English in the spring, you will also see some very nice diagrams in this book. For the first time in any of my book, the well, first time I've had a lot of diagrams. I've had 10 in this book. Um, let me put up that. Diagram here. You, ha you have here the real objects, the real qualities, the sensual objects, the sensual qualities, and these stick lines are the most dominant relations. I call them tensions in the book. And what I try to show here, first of all, is that time and space belong to this schema, because here you have the, the tension that I would call time. You've got sensual objects and the sensual qualities. What is the experience of time? The experience of time is you, s you feel something enduring, but you also feel its changes. You see something you see kind of swirling patina of qualities atop things that change even while the thing itself remains somewhat durable, at least for us, from moment to moment. And this is what we call time. At least the human experience of time. And then there's this. You've got a real object, you know, a real hammer or something that's withdrawn from every access to it, and yet there are qualities of it that are somehow emitted for us to directly contact. And this is what I call space, this diagonal line. Why? Because what is space about? You know, the, the classical debate was between Leibniz and Clark, where for Clark, like Newton, time and space are absolute empty containers, whereas for Leibniz, time and space are relational. I'm a little closer to Leibniz on this, but I don't think he gets it right either. Time and space are not relational, but the, the site of relation and non-relation. Because what is, what is spatial distance? Spatial distance means something is distant and near. I can go to Osaka. I'm not there now but I can think about it. It's not in a completely you know, disconnected universe. It's here, it's something I can get to, it's something I can think about now, and yet I'm not there. That is space. The difference between the real things that are not where I am and the qualities they reach out to us, like tentacles, things you know, of welcome, tentacles of welcome, asking us to approach them. Uh, so now only two of those four are covered. And this brings me to a, a philosophical problem I was wondering about ever since childhood, which is, why do we always talk about time and space as though those are the only two regions of that magnitude that deserve to be always spoken about together? Why is it always time and space? Couldn't we find some deeper model that incorporates those two and also leaves room for others? And yes, um, this is what we call the essence of the thing traditionally. The essence of the thing is the tension between its unity and its plurality of qualities. And then we've got one last line, and I struggled to find a name for this for a couple of years, and then I realized this is the Husserlian Eidos, because what is the Eidos in Husserl? It's you have an object before the mind, say a candle, and through eidetic reduction you're trying to find out what are the essential features of that candle that it must have in order to be what it is. You get those only through categorical intuition. You're never going to be able to essentially make present for Husserl what it is that makes that candle essential. And so those are real qualities that you can only allude to, you can only hint at. And so there are the four basic parts of the charts identified with four of the key terms in the history of philosophy. And there's all these other things that are less important. There end up being ten relations, because these things can relate to each other, these things can relate to each other, and each thing can relate to itself. But those aren't as important, so I'll leave those until you read the book. 
There end up being 10 kinds of relations. So there's this chart you can play with, and there are all kinds of theories you can come up with by looking at these grids. And if you don't like this version, my friends have other versions of OOO, so there's, there's plenty to choose from. You can go shopping in the OOO supermarket. But just to summarize, the spirit of this project is object-oriented philosophy is bringing back objects, not bringing back materialism. It's in many ways an anti-materialist project. I would agree with what Latour says in one of his recent publications, that materialism is always an idealism. Materialism thinks we can replace the thing itself by a certain limited range of palpable qualities of that thing that identify it, and that doesn't work. That's not realism. That is, that is idealism, plain and simple. And so the realism we are arguing for is one of substantial forms, a famous old medieval term, resurrected by Leibniz. And this means returning to Aristotle, who is probably the most unpopular great philosopher right now. Everybody's ripping on Aristotle in every possible way. Aristotle is great. He's also a lot weirder than people think. Go back and read Aristotle, you're going to find strange jokes. You're going to find his, his theories are a lot stranger than you think. And so I would say uh, to contemporary continental philosophy, we need less German idealism, less Bergson, more Aristotle, but a weird Aristotle, which I would describe as an Aristotle from Jupiter rather than from Saturn. Aristotle is not the Saturn philosopher as people think. Thank you very much. I'll take questions now. Yes. Um, and I wrote about this a bit Sorry, in... Could you repeat the question? Sure. Uh, I was uh, hoping that, uh, that Graham could uh, return to why he sees uh, the argument against correlationism to be such a weak argument uh, and to, to situate this in terms of uh, Stove's gem, which he's discussed in the back. I've discussed that in Prince of Networks, yeah. Stove's gem is a, comes from the analytic philosopher David Stove from Australia, who was looking to give a prize to the worst philosophical argument in history, and he gave it to this idealist argument after looking at many contenders uh, that the absolute idealist argument that I can't, if I, I can't think of something outside of me um, without being trapped in the circle. And the, the way you could, you could uh, schematize his argument is that it's a way of saying that um, it, it tries to draw a non-tautological conclusion from a tautological point. The, point. the tautological point is I can't think of something without thinking it. And therefore, it tries to derive the conclusion that, therefore, nothing exists outside of my thinking it. The, the problem with this argument, which, which I treated very positively in Prince of Networks, is that it really works better against the absolute idealist argument, not against the correlationist argument, the, the strong correlationist argument that Mayasu tries to defend. And the way I would attack Mayasu's argument, as I try to do today, is by saying that you can't actually maintain the strong correlationist argument. It becomes idealism, and therefore, it's vulnerable to Stowe's gem. It's purely arbitrary claim that there can't be any, anything existing outside my thinking of it. Um, the reason this seems wrong to me is for a couple of reasons. One is that <coughs> I'm a realist because of Heidegger's tool analysis and how I read it. That's, that's where my realism comes from. So whenever my realism is challenged, that's what I go back to. What would happen if there were no real hammer behind the particular uses of it? There would be no surprise. There would be no rupture. There would be no... Everything would be totally exhausted by its current state here and now. Now, of course, Mayasu can always claim yes, because everything changes for no reason at all. It's purely contingent. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'm not sure I have a, a knockdown argument for that against that right now, except that I think that's arbitrary in his part to think that that's possible. Um, also, I think we know from everyday experience that we can talk about things without talking them, without talking about them. We, we allude to things. The most powerful kinds of language we use, you know, insinuation, hints, metaphors, um, enthymemes more generally in rhetoric, these are all ways that we talk about things without talking about them. So it's not that problematic. It's not, not that problematic to think that every statement has to be an explicit statement that describes the qualities of a thing. That's not how it works. I would say even, I even read Thomas Kuhn this way. A lot of people read the paradigm shift as being this sociological theory that truth is just a social construction and the you know, society decides suddenly to change its science for non-scientific reasons. I don't see it that way at all. I see the paradigm as representing the object deeper than any specific measurements or qualities that we know about it. And then at a certain point, we discover the object is something different from what we thought. And normal science in Kuhn's terms would be an elaboration of the qualities of a thing. Paradigm shifting science alludes to an object that's there that we can't quite describe, but that seems to explain certain phenomena. Um, and allure, of course, which is a term I use in grill metaphysics a lot, is just the, the non-form of allude. 
So in a way, uh, all language does this, already does this, already points to things that we don't know anything about. And I'm, I've also been very influenced by Kripke's arguments about this, that you can, you can point at Columbus, and he's still Columbus, even if you find out he didn't discover America, and even if you find out his birth year was wrong. There's nothing wrong with saying you can rigidly designate Columbus. Whereas it seems to me that in Mayasu's position, that's impossible, that a thing is only its qualities. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Avira, um, Robert Jackson. Oh, he sent a remote yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, that's great. First time I've ever been asked. Right. He's in, where is he, Plymouth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And okay. he wants to know uh, if you could talk about, is there a difference between, if, is the artwork in between equipment and the thing? That's his question. That sounds kind of like Heidegger in yeah. a way. Um, I, I think equipment is just the kind of thing, and I think the artwork is just the kind of thing. But I've made the claim that uh, aesthetics is first philosophy, not ethics, not natural science, not politics, but aesthetics is first philosophy, because for me what aesthetics is about is rupturing the relation between a thing and its qualities, such that you're alluding to a thing is deeper than its qualities. This, this is what style is as well. I've, I'm, I'm a big believer that there's such a thing as a style apart from the corpus of works created by a poet or an artist. I had this argument with a, a sculptor once in Chicago who says there is no such thing as a style. That's just a, you just pile up all the works created by Picasso or Monet and then that's where you, you retroactively deduce the style. I don't think so. Because I think, first of all, the fact that you're able to fake things shows that there is a style. You can, you can make a convincing Picasso fake if you do it well enough because Picasso is a style more than a corpus of genuine works done by a person named Picasso. Um, The book and the novel. Yeah, right. You know that uh, the corpus of a work is, uh, I guess, uh, essential qualities and essential objects. All right. Exemplifying the real object that is a unified thing behind either those paintings or <clears throat> those, those different books or, uh, or whatnot. Uh, okay. Well, I think this is one reason parodies are so important. A good parody will teach you something about a style that the actual works did not. I'm, uh, as far as Robert's question, I think he's, tr he's trying to ask what other people have asked, which is what is the exact difference between an artwork and other kinds of objects, and I'm not, not sure I can give a good explanation of that here on my feet. Why is it that, if I'm saying aesthetics is first philosophy, why, why am I not just saying everything's an artwork, which is not what I want to say. What is it that makes certain things artworks and others not? I'm not sure I have a good answer for that at the moment. Yeah. Oh, actually, it was a question here first, Nathan, and then... You're, you're... Um, I'd like to explore this... Um your comment that was somewhat escaped me about natural philosophy, um, because I come to this uh, as an outsider uh, okay. rooted in the philosophy of information, and I hear uh, toy examples from physics, but I don't hear uh, uh, in the, the work of Mayasu or your suggestion of correlationism, some of the key scientific discoveries and ideas of the last century or so. For example, correlationalism, I hear thermodynamics. I have heard the words the mind a lot, but I've not heard mind, which is a distinctive solution from what you were discussing. And when you talk about chance, I haven't heard about Bayesianism at all, uh -huh. which brings a whole new uh, tilt to this question of chance. So, um, and then you made some comment, which, which kind of slipped past my mind, because I was thinking about what you just said previously about natural philosophy. And, you know, as I say, as an outsider, what I'm hearing is a lot of toy thinking, which I hear a lot from Western philosophers, but I don't hear a gra physical grasp of what these phenomena are getting to. You what, know? what do you mean by toy thinking? Uh, well, you know, the hammer, that kind of thing. Um, you know, without discussing about things about, you know, philosophy of information, uh, you know, the, the flow of physical events and the perception of the hammer, all this kind of thing. We just, you know, pose a mental hammer and think that that's adequate to, to phil philosophically explore the question. That's one example. Correlationalism, as you suggest, uh, you know, that things have some kind of effect, but it's, it, it has of mitigation, you know, well that's what thermodynamics is about. Uh, when you talk about Maya Su's um, uh, critique of uh, chance, you know, this business of the observer is what Bayesianism is about. 
So th there are these immense areas of physical ex experimentation that have gone on in the last century that just seem to go completely unnoticed in this dialogue. Well, what and that that may be because I'm, as I say, I'm an outsider to this, and and I find this a very foreign land, this, this way of approaching the world. These are both. Uh systems of metaphysics, mine may assume. Mesa doesn't like the word metaphysics, but first philosophy. And if you're going to do that, you cannot start with the privilege of, of results from the natural sciences, because you have to cover things that are not just physical. You have to cover things that are historical, that, that are psychological. It has to be a universal theory. And so therefore, you cannot just import one physical theory and try to use that as the basis for everything else. You have to, ha you have to back up a little bit and try to speak very abstractly. That's just the nature of the game. That's, that's the nature of our discipline. Now, what natural science can do, perhaps, in some cases, is provide models. For example, I think Darwin did provide an excellent model for getting rid of the idea in metaphysics that there are eternal forms that stay the same forever, that there are natural kinds that do not alter. Um, I don't think that means that you should just pick up pieces of results from physics and use them to dominate all of, all of philosophy. And so I'm not sure how, um, for example, thermodynamics. Okay, what result from thermodynamics should we bring into this? How, will it be generally applicable enough that it doesn't just apply to phenomena of heat, but that it applies to non-physical non things as well? That's what you have to do when you're doing metaphysics. You have to, you have to work at a more general level. Um, and is, is thermodynamics really correlational? Yeah. I'm not so sure about that. People, people often make the claim, for example, that quantum theory proves the correlationism. Zizek does this all the time. Zizek says how oh, quantum theory proves that there's no reality independent of the mind. But that's just one interpretation of quantum theory out of many, right? That's far from uncontroversial. And that's why I, tr I try to avoid picking up convenient doctrines from, from the science of the day. These things tend to change. Philosophy changes too, but I think you can't just be a slave to the state of the natural sciences in 2010. And this is one. This is where I differ, for example, from these guys, Leidemann and Ross. Ray Brassier is also a speculative realist, but he has this, he, he, he adheres to a form of scientism. And I call it that because they call it that themselves. They sometimes sneer at people for calling it scientism, but then they call it that themselves. And what they think is that metaphysics should be based on Einstein, because that's the most advanced scientific, Einstein has the most advanced theory of space and time we have, and so the metaphysics of space and time should be advanced based on Einstein. The problem is, this isn't even what physicists want. If you listen to, to physicists who are really first rate, they want us to give them new ideas and to speculate beyond the bounds of possibility uh, as known by the contemporary sciences. And this book, Ladyman and Ross, which is worth reading, although I, I hate all the conclusions of it, it's called Everything Must Go. They're trying to claim there can't be any objects in philosophy because quantum theory does not allow objects, to which my answer is, so what? Quantum theory isn't even unified with relativity yet. Why should I throw out all of my metaphysics to, to flatter quantum theory? It can't even get its own house in order. I mean, you can look at it for interesting models, but you can't let it dominate philosophy. It's, it's silly to base all of philosophy in the state of physics today. And I'm not sure if that's approaching your question. I don't really have anything to say about Bayesianism. I bet Mayasu does, because he's, he reads up on all that stuff. Probability isn't really a key to my philosophy, so I don't really have a position on that. I think Nathan was next. Yeah, I have a, a question about... And your, sure. your talk today, I think, uh, clarified one way of opposing it. Um, and maybe that also has to do with the relation between philosophy and science, because okay. science will try to construct you know, has a certain epistemological mm -hmm. framework. Um, and that's often been very important to philosophical reflection as well. Mm -hmm. um, so to pose the question this way, um, you said during your talk today that you think that knowledge of the absolute is impossible. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's one of your differences from Mayus Su. Um, and so then the question is, I mean, certainly you make claims, though, about the in itself. You make claims about the essence of objects in themselves. Mm -hmm. um, that is to say, you make absolute claims. You make claims about the absolute, that which is not only for us, but in itself. And so the question, the question is just epistemologically, then, how do you justify those sorts of claims if you think that knowledge of the absolute is impossible? And, and to, to frame it this way, like I share your opinion um, that no object's relation to another object mm -hmm. exhausts its real being. Mm -hmm. And humans certainly have that in common mm -hmm. with other objects. And so I, I share your critique of the human world, the priority of the human world correlate in that respect. Mm -hmm. But the problem is just that you know, tables do not make claims about the essence of other objects. So tables have a, a table has a limited relation to the floor, mm -hmm. but the table doesn't make a claim about the withdrawal of the floor from relation with the table. Mm -hmm. But you do make that sort of claim. Mm -hmm. 
That is to say, you make claims about essence or about the in itself or about the absolute. So how do you justify that difference in your discourse from the mode of relation exhibited by a table, um, particularly when it seems to me like those sorts of claims about the absolute or the in itself would then contradict your own ontology? In a way, the table does make claims about the floor. It doesn't utter them in speech. But it, but doesn't, it, make it, claim, it doesn't make claims about the floor in itself. As, as unrelated to the table. Right, it's, it, right, it has no access to the difference between the end itself and the table is currently, as the floor is currently constituted. Right. I would argue with that. As for your question about the absolutes, I mean, this is a problem always faced by any claim that there's no absolutes because it's an, are you absolutely saying there are no absolutes? But you've got to remember, I'm not saying there are no absolutes. I'm saying that there's no absolute knowledge, there's no absolute presence of the thing to us. It's a limited claim. I'm not saying there are no absolutes in general. I'm saying that Mayasu cannot claim that our knowledge of a thing exhausts the reality of that thing. For the reasons I said, he's got it. he knows that there's a difference between my knowledge of the table and the table itself. The table holds up a computer, my knowledge of it doesn't. How is he going to explain that difference unless he says that table is instantiated in matter, whereas the table in my mind isn't? And then you end up with a very boring conservative metaphysics of form stamped in matter. So, But the question is just how do you epistemologically mm -hmm. justify the claims that you make about the end itself? given that like, mm -hmm. you don't hold that knowledge of the absolute is possible. I don't hold knowledge of the absolute is possible because I think you can know it's there without absolutely knowing what it is. It's just the same as Heidegger's tool analysis. That Mayasu would say you can actually know the hammer exhaustively. I'm saying all you can know is that the hammer is there. It's deeper than any of its manifest qualities, than any of its relations. So you're pointing. You're alluding to the hammer. That's not really absolute. Unless I'm, I'm absolutely alluding to the hammer, maybe. But it's not. I'm not getting direct access to the qualities of it, to the reality of it, because you can't. Um, whereas Mayasu is saying you can actually adequately know the hammer. So I think that's, there's a difference there. Uh, who's next? Maybe I should go to the... Because we can always... Um, if I understood you correctly, you object to Mayasu's assertion that um, my knowledge of the origin of the universe is um, different from my knowledge of, let's say, the object hidden in the refrigerator somewhere. Uh -huh. I think he simply makes an arbitrary decision that the difference in time is more challenging to the correlate than the difference in space. I would go even further. I, I don't even think you have to have an object in a refrigerator in an abandoned house. I think you can have the object right in front of you, and it's still just as distant from you as the Big Bang is. Because I think that the thing itself is never adequately mirrorable in the knowledge. Whereas for Mayasu, somehow the fact that something existed in time before any thought world correlate existed before any thought existed is somehow uniquely challenging to correlationism. But couldn't you make the same claim about something spatially remote, like something inside of a black hole that is inaccessible to any consciousness? He, I don't think he provides an argument for whatever. He sort of asserts it in that it, it supplements the English book, that now this is obviously the temporal discrepancy is more important than the spatial one. He thinks the spatial one is harmless and can be easily removed, and that's why he wants to get rid of it. Right? He, he thinks that the correlationist cannot answer the challenge of the Big Bang, but he thinks the correlationist can easily answer the challenge of the, the object in the refrigerator by saying, actually, Mesa's example is a vase in a country house. The vase in the country house is, um, um, in principle, someone could go to the house and look at it. But I would say, in principle, someone could go back to the Big Bang. We weren't. We weren't there. But actually, he himself even says this. He himself says, in principle, humans could have been there since the Big Bang. We, you know, they weren't, but they could have been in so I just don't think it's an argument he ever makes. I don't think he ever establishes that the, the temporal discrepancy is more important than the spatial one. And, um, well, yeah, you're next, Ian. Uh, this is actually from, from the internet. Oh, uh, from who? Uh, Paul Ennis in Dublin. Oh, excellent. I love this. Uh, so Paul wondered if, if you could talk about what you think the future direction of speculative realism might look like. Yes. Uh, a lot of this comes from Levi's prodding, which is that the way philosophical movements really work is they create work for other disciplines. They have to be less self-enclosed, 
we, uh, speculative, you know, object-oriented philosophy, I should say, becomes bigger because people are using it for things I never expected. So I'm getting email from architects, from archaeologists, from medievalists, you name the discipline. All these people are finding uses for it that I could never come up with because I don't know those fields well enough. And so I think we, the future probably involves, we, I at least, have, have fallen into what Zizek calls the fate of the philosopher, which is that we are mad men obsessively repeating the same principles over and over again. And so there's a sense in which all of my books are circling back around these same foundational principles, and I want to get out of that and start being more concrete. And my lecture later today, I'm trying to do a bit of that by coming up with different kinds of methods we can use uh, to respond to the challenge of objects. So I think solving a few problems that are still there, not yet solved, and also finding more fruitful ways to apply it to other things in ways that might retroactively transform the principles of the philosophy itself. Did he give a reason, uh, an answer to what he thought the future was? It was on Twitter, so he didn't have room. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I have a um, sort of following up on, on the question of how or, or what are we really solicited to say about real objects. Yes. Um, I mean, it's true that Heidegger makes this, I mean, we've worked on this point before, that um, Heidegger makes a point about how, you know, our dealing, our theoretical Pressing the hand is never never exhausted the being of the object, so to speak. And yet, you know, we know that for Heidegger, particulars and objects as such are merely derivative forms mm -hmm. of human engagement. For Heidegger, mm -hmm. that is to say, it doesn't make any sense to speak about the theoretic entity as a particular mm -hmm. apart from human comportment, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And what he what what he thinks withdraws is rather this much more abstract notion of being as such. So mm -hmm. when you have a fundamental attunement something like anxiety or profound boredom, et cetera, et cetera. You don't really obtain a sort of disclosure of objects, but you get this sort of more general opening of what he calls being as a whole or something. Like that. Yeah. Right? But uh, I mean, you're making, so the question here becomes, what claims are being made in, in an object-oriented ontology about real objects? And it seems to me that uh, it's, it's minimal thus far, insofar as it claims they exist. One, mm -hmm. You know, they have parts, essential qualities, et cetera, et cetera. And so my, my only question is, um, in this regard, is, well, how do we know there are really real objects? That's the first one. Okay. And, and the other one is, I mean, I, I know we've also like discussed, but I'm wondering if there is any principle of individuation for real objects that, that uh, is within our cognitive grasp. That's to say, when we say, when we speak about, for example, you, you mentioned before, the real cotton, the real fire, right? right? I mean, the, the, the easy way to, the easy quine comes across and says, well, how do we know there's really a real fire and not fire parts or something of the sort? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the problem here is that if we have no epistemic way to say which are real objects and which aren't, mm -hmm. it seems that, and if, you know, just the real objects are perpetually withdrawn from our axis, mm -hmm. it seems that all of our descriptions, intentional descriptions, whether they are scientific, philosophical, or whatever else, mm -hmm. potentially, at least, conform to a real object underneath my, my intention, mm -hmm. right? And the, and the problem then is that it becomes ex extraordinarily difficult to discern what really um, is a real object and, and to really separate it from a sort of um, dogmatic imposition of the in itself, which starts to resemble in that regard something like, you know, an anonymous field of phantoms lurking behind the conscious apprehension. Mm -hmm. so that's one thing. And, and the other thing, I'll just in passing, I, I was sort of problematizing something about Meyasu and about how he tries to escape from the relations and um, there's an argument there, you know, when he's trying to rebut the, the subjective idealist, right? What he says is he falls back into finitude, so he, you know, basically salvages Kant infinity from idealism, and says, well, the thing is, I know that I cannot uh, find a reason for my own being. Therefore, it is possible that I could see success. Uh -huh. That is not something that's relative to my, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this has to be absolute. Now, but from this, Mayasud goes on to deduce or to <coughs> extrapolate the contingencies of future things in themselves, right? Mm -hmm. now, now, my question here would be simply, hasn't Mayasud simply established the necessity of the contingency of his own being, but no. not of all beings in themselves? I mean, this is something that's, that's, that's kind of embodied. Of course, if the correlation is contingent, then you can say that the appearances, as they appear, mm -hmm. are contingent as well. But I'm not sure that, I mean, he has established that things in themselves have to be continued as well. Um, so just... 
I would agree with that, and actually Levi's made that same point on his blog, that he doesn't think that that step of the proof works. Am I remembering correctly? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I would agree with you on that. I think it's another problem. Uh, the earlier part of your question, I think, actually had two different questions. And one of them was, how do we know, this had to do with Heidegger's fundamental moods. One of Heidegger's problems, I think, is he tends, he often tends, not always, to identify the difference between real and present at hand with the difference between one and many. And this is the problem with his analyses of moods. What Heidegger's analyses of moods always give you this kind of sublime effect where you know, it's boredom or it's angst or it's love even sometimes that gives you the sense of being as a whole. Why does it have to be a being as a whole? Why can't it be of some specific being in itself apart from our experience of it? Um, he doesn't do that in all, of his, all periods of his career. For example, when he comes back and talks about the fourfold and the thing, there are traces there of some sensitivity to individual objects in themselves. Not always, because Earth, Earth has a certain monistic unity to it all. There's one Earth that everything partakes of. How do we know that, there, that that's there? I would say because um, what sense would it make to say that there's kind of, this kind of homogeneous underground world that then erupts into specific things for our perception? Um, either there's one thing or there are many, and if there are many, I say we call them objects. What I don't, often don't like about this sort of deleuze simon Don approach to the problem is they're both one and many. You see this in Delana too. It's kind of a, a halfway house. That there, there are all these virtualities, but they're you know they're not quite different, and yet they are different. Why not just bite the bullet? And either it's your total monist who thinks that there's just being, and then everything, all the individuals are just illusions of our senses, or say that there's object, there's individuals. Um, I don't think you can decompose them into parts because then the parts will be individuals, right? And then you, you, that'd be an infinite regress. You have to have something that's an individual in the end, otherwise there would not be individual effects. And I just, um, just on that question of the infinite regress, uh, I might have missed this in, in your writings. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, you, back back in you know, the period of the time of the collapse theory, and mm -hmm. you used to um, defend not only the possibility of infinite regress, but even in progress. Even, that, that, uh, that is an upward. And, I mean, that, that that was possible. That wasn't an, a scary possibility in your thought. And you said, oh, well, an infinite regress. What's so bad about that? Right. Did you change your position? Or? No, no, I'm just, I'm just using the term ambiguously. You're good at calling me on it. Uh, the, what, what did I just say was wrong about the infinite regress? You're right, I did, but I shouldn't have used that term. Oh, I said there, there has to right, there have to be some individuals. Right, the idea that, that you seem to be at odds with was that um, we have to arrive at some sort of basic substratum of reality. Blah, blah, blah. Not a substratum. There have to be individuals. That's not. So I think that is true because you can't. Nothing. Nothing can occur. You either have individuals or you have a kind of unified field of everything mushed together. An operon. And yes. It, there has to be an infinite regress because you can't come to a final point that's a substratum. So there is an infinite regress of objects in my system. There's not an infinite progress, though. There is a surface of the ocean. There's not a bottom. So, so yeah, imagine a bottomless sea with a, with a finite surface. Uh, and this is why I think there can be what I call dormant objects or sleeping objects, objects that are at the top, that are, are created by other smaller objects but are not yet affecting anything else, not yet in relation to anything else. And it's a strange idea, but I was led to it just by the requirements of the, the argument. Let me get to your other question really quickly. How do we know objects? I think, first of all, some people mistakenly hope that there can be some experience when we're face-to-face -face with the real, and there it is. Now I have scientific truth. Even science doesn't work this way. When did that ever happen in science? It might happen in geometry, but when did it ever happen in science? Where, where are um, all of the scientific objects of the past? Many of them have been obliterated, and many of our current ones will also be obliterated. Uh, so I don't think we can ever know for sure that this object is real. We, this is human fate. So we can never know which of our friends are real friends. We can never know what, what's not a dream. We can, never, we can never know what's going to happen next week. Uh, so I don't think there is a way we can directly know these things. I think we have methods, though, and that's what my second talk is going to be about this afternoon. What are, so, what are some ways we can start building methods to, sort, to sift real objects from pseudo-objects? Because unlike Latour, I think there are pseudo-objects. I don't think everything is equally real if it has an effect on something else. Because Batman has an effect on us, and I wouldn't say that Batman is real in the same sense that this is real. So how, what methods do you use? And I've got four that I came up with that I'm going to talk about later today, so I'll, I'll leave that for then. Um, but there's a certain modesty here to this position. When, when you, I mean, this is yeah. a metaphysical point about the structure of objects, not a point about our knowledge of objects. And so it's not, you know, the claim being made is not that when I talk about class later on today, for instance, that I'm certain that class exists. Uh, you know, right. A, there, there seems to be lots of level reasons at the level of central qualities and central objects to yeah. say that something like class exists. That's right. But it could be phlogiston. That's right. So. That's right, but atoms are in the same position. Atoms are, we, we, yeah. we think we know atoms because there's this heavily mediated tradition of scientific knowledge that could also collapse as well. Seems very unlikely now. 
but it could. Yeah, and class is a much more obvious example. We, right, we, we never have that direct contact with what objects really exist. That's just an inevitable aspect of this philosophy. Any other questions? One more question. Um, I wanted to ask a question that may actually just be from this point and something you're going to talk about more later. Mm -hmm. It's just in terms of the dangers that you are concerned about as uh, these two branches of philosophy uh, move forward uh, and expand. Uh -huh. Is pseudo-object the, the largest danger? Or what, what would you see as the problematic misunderstandings or misapplications that you're most, most concerned about? Um, this stuff comes up on the blogosphere all the time. There are all kinds of critiques that I find unfortunate. I just have to try to remember some of them right now. I've been trying to put these out of my mind. Yeah, but wait, wait, that's the simple you one. Hate humans, right? That, right, this is a simple one. People say, oh, you hate humans, you're treating humans as objects. You're going to treat us as slaves, or you're, you know, you're going to say people are material for... Mm -hmm. Of course, you, get, you got that kind of silly objection to Heidegger's tool analysis, too. He's claiming everything's a tool. Everything's just a tool. Of course not. He's saying the opposite. He's saying that things are deeper than their tool, their use value. Um, no, just a mistake, let's say, okay. but in terms of misapplication. Oh, misapplication. Misunderstand in ways that you'll be concerned about. Because it seems that it's very likely, very possible. Theologizations, for example. What kind? Theologizations. Theologizations? I don't think anyone's tried object only theology yet, but it's gone. <laughs> maybe it could. It could. Um, right, not, not just misunderstandings, but dangers. What is the inherent danger of the theory? Every, every theory does have a danger. Every theory becomes a vice after a while. This will be, Assuming this succeeds, it will be a vice in 50 years, and I'd, I'd be happy to dump it if I'm still alive then. And it's gone too far. People have adopted it too much. Uh, what, what would be the vices that would make me want to jettison my own theory 40, 50 years from now? Um, I haven't thought of that before. Well, maybe we can talk about it over the day. Yeah, that's good. I suspect the forgetting of withdrawal. Forgetting of withdrawal. Dangerous, you know, that we'll just talk dogmatically about objects. Okay. And, uh, you know, not even, and, and I think this goes back to the question about entropy. Mm -hmm. but one of the premises behind that question seemed to be that objects refer to material things. Yes. And then all these other strange kind of immaterial objects that exist in you as well. Mm -hmm. And so we'll just end up talking about material objects and, and uh, withdrawal will be forgotten as this sort of abyss that's contained within any object. Okay. And so a kind of reduction, once again, back to the central object and that's, essential that's quality. Right. Kind of thing I was yeah. thinking about, uh -huh. really, there's a, a sense that it almost is an anti metaphysical possibility that people could simply say, well, okay, kind of positive as yeah, exactly. like uh -huh. So it would be like almost like uh, Ian Lacan forgetting the split of the subject and just treating the signifier as exactly. self evident. Interesting. But, uh, but one thinks mm -hmm. about deconstruction nowadays, the way it's kind of just morphed into critique into some vague way. It's a good point. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe that's what we have to watch out for. We'll have to be careful. <laughs> Thank you. Good question, too. Terrific. This okay. was a wonderful way to begin. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you some background. Yeah, we've got some really interesting, smart grads from all different disciplines here. Seems like it. Yeah, so that's quite, quite wonderful. And many of these people are people I know from the internet, so I'm just meeting for the first time. That's great. How cool. Yeah. I'm delighted by this. Yeah. 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 We're actually watching and asking questions. I wish I better turn this off. Yeah. Oh, is that your recorder? It's or? Tim Morton's. Okay. Uh, Tim, how do I turn this off? Oh. I, and are you still broadcasting this now?